turning to the book of Exodus. It's going to start in chapter 13. So, I read a lot. I like to read. I enjoy it. And I try to read different things. I, I don't do a very good job of doing that. I typically in one strain of books on theology and biblical studies. But I do try to veer from that every now and then. And I have decided this year, I know it's going to come as a shock to many of you. I have never read the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I know. I know. And so this year I decided to embark on the journey. Yes. And it's been good. It's been good. I'm almost through with the first book. I'm ready to get into the next part of the story. It's going to be good. Uh, so I'm excited about it, but it's been bringing to mind all of the Lord of the Rings world, right? And, and, and as I was reading this text and I was thinking about the sermon this morning, it brought to my mind a, a scene in actually not the Lord of the Rings, but The Hobbit, where Bilbo, they're in the, they're in the forests of Mirkwood, right? And he goes up to see where they're at. They're lost, they're wandering, they don't know where they're, what's going on, and he gets above the trees, and he sees where they are. He sees the, um, the, the water and the river, and he can even see the, the, the mountain ahead, and so he finally has his bearings because he can see where they're going. He heads up the tree, looks around, gets some fresh air, gets taken away from the heir of Mirkwood. But here's, here's why he did that. He needed to see the whole terrain, right? He had to capture a vision of the destination and then set their aim in the right direction before they started moving again. And I think this is a helpful reminder for us as we work through this book, as we walk through the book of Exodus, and as we have done so, I think, for five to six weeks now, and we're continuing the journey. It's always important when you're down in the midst of the trees of biblical study that you don't forget the whole terrain, right? That you don't lose sight of the destination. As you study each section in a, in a particular book or a particular narrative, you want to make sure that you're thinking in the right direction even as you come to that specific story in the text. So we need to see again, I think, where we are in Exodus. And I'm not sure if this is synced up or not, so we'll have to, I don't know if it's going to work. Matt, you might have to do it. Oh, yeah, you're, you're going to have to do it this time because I didn't get it synced up. So we have the terrain of where we're going, of where we've come, of where we're going. The first part is God saves Israel from Egyptian bondage. And then the next significant section is where God gives Israel his law. And then finally, the third of the book is all about this tabernacle that God commands Israel to build as a dwelling place for him. That's where the whole story is going. If, if I were to put it another way, um, kind of summarizing it a little bit on the next slide, the destination is going to the dwelling of God with his people. God delivers Israel. He establishes his covenant with Israel. And then he dwells with them. And in fact, you get to Exodus 29, verse 46, in that final section of the book, and God says, I've done all that I have done for you that I might dwell among you. God's intention through this whole book of Exodus, through this whole salvation, through this whole redemption, is that he would dwell with his people. That's where he's been taking, that's where he's taking us. So we need to see that that's the whole terrain here. As we go back into the text, that's where God is taking them. And it's an incredible story. I mean, this story of Israel being formed as a nation and becoming God's people and, and having God dwell among them, it's a beautiful story, and, and, and I want to summarize it in this way. If you look, here's kind of the, the way it happens in a summary form. Here's Israel's story as a nation. They need a deliverer. They need deliverance and liberation. And God gives a deliverer to his people. God gives salvation to them through judgment and lamb, the shed blood of the lamb. He then gives them a new identity as they pass through the water. He gives them a gift in this, in, of, the, of the law to his people. 
And then he ends with giving his presence to his people. This is Israel's story as a nation. They need deliverance. They're given a deliverer. They're given salvation through judgment and through the blood of the Lamb. A new identity, a gift, and God's presence. I hope when you read that, it looks very familiar to you. I hope Israel's story and their journey looks very familiar to another story. To maybe one that strikes you a little more personally and us as a church corporately. Because there's many things that are the same. There's many ways that God works where he's just repeating a pattern. And it's good to see the connections. Let's go into the text. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. We've just come from the finalization of the plagues. The Lord has come and killed the firstborn son of Egypt and saved his people through the shed blood of the lamb. Everyone who had the lamb's blood on their doorpost, the angel of death passed over. And that's why they celebrate the Passover now as the identifying reality of them as a nation. It's even a part of their calendar. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And now the Lord is guiding them as they're leaving Egypt. The, the Pharaoh has finally said, okay, I, I, I admit defeat. You guys can go. And they're gone, and they're leaving with abundance, and people are giving them things. Anything they ask for, it's given to them. And Israel is on their way out. And the, how, are, how do they know where to go? How do they know which route to take? Well, God is leading them. God is leading them with a pillar of cloud and fire. <laughs> This is pretty sweet. Go to chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay, so here's the first thing, and I'm going to summarize. Uh, you can go to the next slide here. This is kind of the movements of the text we're going to talk about this morning. The Lord guides Israel with his presence. The Lord saves Israel from their enemy. And Israel worships the Lord for his deliverance. That's what's happening within this larger narrative unit of Exodus. And so right here we see that the Lord is guiding Israel with his presence. His presence is being seen to th by them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, this is really interesting because this is actually all through the book of Exodus. When God first appeared to Moses, what form did he take? How did Moses see the Lord? In Exodus chapter 3, it was in a, in a fire, in a burning bush, right? That did not burn. The angel of the Lord, or the Lord himself, or a representative, however you want to see that text. But still, God is mediated through fire in this sense. And you go back to Exodus 3, 12. And when God first appears to Moses, he says this in verse 12, when he's talking to them from the fire. He said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt and you shall serve God on this mountain. Back in the burning bush, God said, here's your sign, Moses. I'm going to deliver you to, out of Egypt and you're going to come worship me on the mountain. And Moses, in this conversation with God in chapter 3, is like, but God, I already, why? How, how can I know this is going to work out? And God gives Moses a promise. He says, I will be with you. That's God's promise to Moses. That's all Moses needs. We do realize this, right? If God is with you, that's all you need. And because God is with Moses, Israel is delivered from Egypt. Israel is delivered from and they're being led by the presence of God in a pillar of cloud and fire. And it doesn't stop there. 
If you go forward to Exodus chapter 19, they finally come to the mountain. They finally come to the mountain. And this is an intense verse. 1918. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. <laughs> when they come to the mountain, God descends on the mountain in smoke and fire. So he meets Moses in a burning bush. He's leading the people through the pillar of cloud and fire. They get to the mountain, and God's presence descends on the mountain, and it is full of smoke and fire, and it's trembling greatly. And then you get to the very last chapter of Exodus. And the tabernacle is finally built and established. And the very last verses of the book of Exodus, where's God taking us? What's the point of this departure? What is God ultimately about with his people? What does he want to do with his people? And you see it in the very end of Exodus, the last verses that are said in verse, chapter 40, verse 36. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Cloud and fire in the tabernacle at the end of Exodus. It's kind of been this, this theme of God's presence. This is, what, this is what it's been all about. God wants a people with whom he will dwell. This is what it's been about from the beginning. With the garden, Adam and Eve in the garden, and God was establishing a people with whom he could dwell. And you get all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, and what do you have? You have God with his people with whom he dwells. That's where we're going. God's presence is what our deepest longings are for. It's what we were made for. We were made to be in God's presence. And you see this in the book of Exodus as Israel becomes God's people and nation, as they're chosen to be God's people and nation, and God ultimately forms them into a place where he dwells. So that's chapter 13 as he leads them with cloud and fire, and we'll come back to that conversation when we get to the tabernacle. But let's move forward in the story. The next thing is the Lord saves Israel from their enemy. The Lord saves Israel from their enemy. You say, I thought, I thought they'd been saved. <laughs> I thought they'd already been delivered. Well, Pharaoh had a change of heart. Uh, so here's how I've summarized it. I was doing this in my equip class unnaturally or uh, subconsciously, but now I, this was intentional. Okay, they're all C's. See, I, I, had, I was already planned. Um, so here's how I've summarized it just because, honestly, it was fun. Um, God coordinates, Egypt changes, Israel cries, Moses calls, the people cross, the waters cave, the battle ceases. That's, if you were to, if you were to take the, the text in verses, in verse chunks of like two or three verses where it separates itself, that's the story. That's how the text tells the story. God coordinates the plan. He says, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to go down. Well, actually, you know what? Let's just read it. All right. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi ha ha between Migdol and the sea, in front of baal Zephon. you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with them and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. 
And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by that place in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. We're going to stop with the story there. <laughs> God coordinates the plan. He sets it all up. He's been doing this the whole time through the whole story. He'll tell Moses what's going to happen, and then Moses goes and obeys, and it happens according to how God had it planned. God has yet in the book of Exodus and Genesis to have a prediction that did not take place. He has yet to be surprised. His plans cannot be thwarted. And then Egypt changes their mind here. Now, have you ever read this part and you've been like, really, Pharaoh? Like, are you that dumb? Did you not just experience the wrath of God in the plagues? Did you not just lose your firstborn son because of your stubbornness and hard-heartedness towards God? Like, Pharaoh, what are you thinking? It's actually probably not as random as it seems. And I was, I was helped by this because, you know, we're thinking about things so logically in our post-enlightenment world. But this was a different world. It was an ancient world. And they had a different understanding of the gods and how these victories and these battles played out. And this one commentator says, To all the ancients, the gods and goddesses that controlled the world were arbitrary and capricious, quick to change their actions and attitudes, constantly vying with one another for power, not omnipresent, but manifesting themselves at given locations and then leaving those locations unpredictably. So to an ancient mind, in their understanding of gods and, and goddesses, it could have been that now they're in a different location. Maybe, maybe Israel's God doesn't really care for them anymore. Maybe he's done with them. Maybe we have a chance now. Maybe our God will step up to the fight, and maybe we can finally defeat them. So it's not as random as it seems. It could have just been within the ancient framework of how the gods vied for power. <laughs> the problem is, is Pharaoh doesn't realize that his gods are no gods, and the Israel's God is God. He doesn't get that yet. So they're out, moved in a different location, and he says, you know what, let's go, let's go after them. We can beat them this time. We can defeat them and their God this time. And when Israel sees Egypt coming, they cry, and they grumble, and they complain, and we're going to talk about that next week, because that's a constant pattern that I think we will all identify with greatly next week. But let's look at what Moses says. He says to them, guys, fear not, stand firm. And you can stand firm and just watch. Just watch the salvation of the Lord. All you need is to be still. I got an image when I read that of like a dad, you know, building a house or doing a work project and his like three-year-old son says, hey dad, can I help? You know? And the dad's like, sure, buddy. Why don't you come over here? Here's a piece of wood and a nail. You take this hammer and just start hitting the nail. Right there. That's right, buddy. Good job. You stand over there. We're going to be over here. You know, and the child lasts about 30 seconds, and then they get bored, and then they go do something else. And, you know, but it's, uh, it's funny because the little three-year-old can't help with this project. It's above him. He can't understand the concepts. He can't do the labor. He would be of no help. And God, to all of Israel, as an army comes, 
like a massive Egyptian army with chariots and horsemen and, and soldiers and a pharaoh who's the most powerful man in the ancient world at that time. And you you're literally have this massive army coming. And, you, and Israel had their armies. They had their soldiers. They had their young men. They were probably all getting in line, getting all, you know, set up, getting ready for battle. And God's like, uh, okay, guys, come over here. I'm, I'm going to handle this. I've got you on this one. Moses says, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be still. Just be silent. Just don't do anything stupid. <laughs> So, the Lord fought for Israel. He did it. And you know the story. I'm not going to break this part down. You know the story. The people cross as he, as Moses lifts up the staff and the waters part and they become like walls of water on both sides and they pass through the waters on dry land. And then Egypt comes in after them to overtake them, to pursue them. Somehow that didn't make them afraid. <laughs> I have no clue how. As, I mean, I, I just don't understand. But they went in after Israel. And Israel comes out. The waters cave in. And you come all the way to Exodus 14, verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. They saw the salvation of the Lord and so they feared and believed. This whole story is a biblical paradigm of salvation. This is what salvation looks like in the word of God. This is how it happens. This is how it goes down. The Lord does all the work, and we believe. And we trust. The Lord goes to battle and fights. And we in response fear, tremble, believe, trust, and worship. Exodus is a paradigm for our salvation. We can just bring that slide up. It just says that. It's a repeated theme reality or story all through scripture and I honestly could take another two hours to walk through just some of the books and, or, and maybe we need a book or a special seminar or something sometime just to see how this paradigm, this theme of salvation through the Exodus becomes repeated over and over again in all of the scriptures. I won't do it now, I promise. <laughs> a two hour sermon, that'd be awful. Exodus is a paradigm for understanding our salvation. And, and it's, also, it's also a paradigm for understanding Jesus' life and the salvation he won for us. Yeah, I'm going to jump straight to Jesus right now. Because this, I could walk you through all of the biblical storyline and get to Jesus, but we're just going to, I'm just going to, you're going to have to trust me that it's there. We'll have to walk through it sometime. But we're just going to go straight to Jesus as the ultimate climax of this paradigm. Jesus' life, remember he's born, his own birth story is him under threat from a, from a ruler of the day, and he has to escape to Egypt, and as he's coming back from Egypt, the, the authors are saying this is just like the story of Israel, he's re-embodying the story of Israel in his life, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah are standing on the mountain talking to him, and what are they talking about? Luke 9.31 says they're talking about his exodus. They're talking, it says, your tra English translation might say departure, but it's the Greek word for exodus. When he's on the Transfiguration Mount, talking to Moses and Elijah, they're talking about his future 
exodus because what he is about to do with his death and resurrection is going to kind of re re be uh, recapitulate it's a weird word but recapitulate what happened to israel it's, you're going to see the pattern again jesus gets to the lord's supper and and he says this is my body broken for you this is my blood shed for you because i'm the passover lamb through whom you must go in order to be saved from death. Uh, my blood is going to be what's going to need to be covering you so that you are not destroyed by death. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer who, just like Moses, he's, he's the new and better Moses, and Hebrews makes this point, where he comes and he delivers his people from slavery to sin and death and Satan, and he delivers them into a new kingdom. <laughs> the Lord has fought for us. That, that's the point. That's the application. It's not that the Lord will fight for you in all of your individual circumstances and challenges in your life. Just as the Lord fought for Israel, so he'll fight for you when your car breaks down. Or so he'll fight for you when, when your son goes astray. Or so he'll fight. Those, there's other texts that, you can, that can encourage us and comfort us in those moments. But the Exodus paradigm of salvation is about something so much bigger than just our individual circumstances and needs within an everyday life. The, the Exodus story comes to its climax and its culmination in the fact that Jesus has fought for us. And we had only to be still. <laughs> Jesus did all the work. We can and should apply the Exodus to our everyday self-understanding, recognizing that Christ achieved the ultimate Exodus. He has accomplished the ultimate defeat to our world's greatest enemy, and so has achieved the most incredible of all deliverances. Jesus has done it. Every day, our lives are shaped and framed by this salvation. God's redemption of our lives through Christ, it gives us a new identity and a completely new outlook on our lives. It, it gives us a greater story by which we process our daily circumstances. Every day you awaken, you are in this new way. You're in this new family. You have a new identity, and it's all been accomplished because Jesus Christ died and rose again. His exodus now frames our life. His salvation that he wrought for us, that he, he did, he accomplished for us, now shapes our life. So, so here's how it kind of connects the dots for us. Every trial and tribulation that comes to you is framed and understood within the greater story of your life that the Lord has fought for you and he has won. So, listen to this. Your circumstances can't change this. Your failures can't change this. Your trials can't change this. This is something that has already been done. Jesus Christ has fought for you. He has won salvation for you. You have only to believe. He's already done all the work. It's not a come to me and then I'll give you all a list of rules to do so that you can kind of make it work for me within my kingdom. No, he's done. He chose Israel before he gave them the law. He saved Israel and delivered Israel before he told them, this is how I want you to be as my community. Grace comes first. Salvation comes first. And it's all the work of our God. And we bring nothing. We have only to fear not, which is a beautiful, encouraging word. Don't fear Stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight.
fight for you and has fought for you. You have only to be still and believe. That's where the Exodus paradigm becomes a paradigm of what Christ's salvation has accomplished. We don't know the hows, whens, or whys of our sorrow and suffering. But we know the Lord has delivered. The Lord Jesus Christ has fought for us, his people. He has become the Passover lamb on the cross by which we escape the ultimate death. In fact, he buried death in a watery grave. He buried death in the grave. Just like the Egyptians drowned in the, in the Red Sea, Jesus Christ buries death in its grave. It's one of my favorite songs, Death in His Grave. You should look it up. We are baptized into Him. Baptized into Christ through water so that we as a newly created people can have a new start, just like Israel. They were a newly constituted people Saved through blood and water. And there are new people with a new start, with a new goal, with a new land, a new promise. And they, and they have a, a guide, and it's the presence of God. And we likewise have been given the Spirit to guide us and to be God's empowering presence with us until the day when He finally brings us all home to the promised land. This is our story. This is our story except interpreted and seen through the life and the salvation of Jesus Christ. So we can fear not and stand firm and see the salvation Jesus has won for us where we had only to be still. It's all of Christ. And so when you get this, when you recognize that your salvation had nothing to do with your upbringing, nothing to do with your works, nothing to do with, with your abilities and your giftings and your, the, the things you brought to the table, when you realize that it's all of Christ, and has, whether, whether you grew up in, in, a, in a difficult home where you'd never heard of Christ and, and you, were, you were in maybe the depths of, what, of where sin can lead, or maybe you grew up in some nice conservative Christian home and, and you did everything right and you never did anything wrong and you, and you had the righteous, quote-unquote, righteous life. You didn't do anything for your salvation. You didn't achieve any part of it. It was all of Christ, for apart from Christ, we can do nothing. That's the good news. We're all in the same boat needing salvation from Jesus Christ. No matter what your story, there's a greater story that frames us. And so, when we, as those who have been brought from the wrong boat to the right boat, which is Christ, and we're all in it together with all of our different stories and all of our different journeys and all of the different ways God brought us to himself, but all through Christ, we then become a community. We become a people. And what do we do as God's people who have seen his salvation, who have been delivered from slavery, who have been set free from bondage, who are now brought into a new community with a new hope and a new land that we're working towards, how do we respond to the salvation of the Lord? We respond the exact same way Moses responds. The exact same way Israel responds. We sing. <laughs> we sing. We dance. We celebrate. We rejoice because our God fought for us. Singing is not a cultural thing. It's a human thing. Every culture, tribe, nation, and tongue puts their lives and their stories in song. And we put our story in song as well. And we lift high the name of Jesus. We don't just come here and sing because that's what we do as a Christian religion. We come and sing because it is our story. It is our identity. 
and we will lift high the name of Jesus, and it's so good to do it with one another, in sync with one another, in rhythm with one another. As we praise our God who has fought for us, it's why it really is a travesty when we sing these songs and you don't ever feel the freedom to dance or to lift up your hands or to shout for joy or to clap or to smile. Now sometimes there is a place for lament. We see that as a part of Israel's worship as well. In a suffering, broken world, sometimes we don't come celebrating. Sometimes we come and we just need to question and wrestle and call out and say, God, where are you? There's a time for all of this in the worship of our church. But there are times, and there should be times in your life where you can't contain yourself. Because God is dwelling with us now. Because he's won the day. He's fought for us. He's accomplished all that was necessary for our salvation. He's done the work. And so we sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. He has defeated our enemies. We have a new life now in him. Death is beaten. Christ is risen from the grave. That's how we're going to end this service. We're going to end this singing our hallelujahs to our God because he has given us an exodus where we have been brought out of bondage to sin and death and have been brought into a new life through his blood and through the waters of baptism into a newly constituted people who live and for his glory as we look forward to our new home, the promised land. That's our story. That's what he's doing in us. That's, that's, what, that's how he's formed us. And before we do, let's read the song of Moses. By the way, the church in Revelation, I didn't write this verse down. I'm not going to remember where it's at. Yes, I am. Revelation 15. Before we read, I just want you to see this. It, I mean, if you look at the book of Revelation where everything's coming to its climactic end, how is the book of Revelation structured? It's structured by its hymns and by its songs. Revelation is, is, all, is all singing. <laughs> There's singing going on because worthy is the lamb who was slain. And, and in chapter 15 of Revelation, verse 3, it says, this is speaking of the church, they sing the song of Moses. <laughs> we sing the song of Moses. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Everything that God is doing in us and doing in this world, he's taking us to a place where we are singing his praises. And this is what Moses does. So let's read together. And a band, why don't you guys come on up as I read Psalm, or not Psalm, you sing Psalms, Exodus 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Where did Jesus sit when he ascended to the Father? At his right hand. Jesus is at the right hand. He is the arm of the Lord accomplishing all of these things. 
in the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Lycia. Now the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, And all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And the author of the song we're about to sing does a little bit of a metaphorical twist. And he says, our salvation has been drowned. Not drowned, has been won. As our sins, our enemy, for which the wages of sin is death, has now been drowned in seas of crimson. Because it's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we find our salvation. And it's through Christ's resurrection that we see what our hope looks like. He is good, and he is great, and he is worthy of our worship. Would you stand? And let's sing to our God this morning.